and there will be time for Q&A. I want you to add to the questions that you have. The questions you have are based just on your own thoughts, but as, um, as the presentation begins and continues, you're gonna have additional questions. I want you to write them down. I expect everybody to ask at least one. All right, let's give a hand to reflecting on my high school experience and I was taught nothing about the prison system when I was in high school and I think it's amazing that you all are having an opportunity to in a high school setting learn about the prison system um, and so we're just excited to join our voices to the, to the choir. Um, my name is Adrian and I'm a member of CCWP and I've, I've been a member of CCWP for three years. Um, I come to this work as someone who did not have direct experience with the prison system, but um, through various other avenues. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of the organization and sort of what our framework is and what we do, and then I'm going to hand it over to Wendy and Dagmar. Um, and then we also have a really exciting protest that we're planning that's two weeks away that we're going to share some videos with you guys about and hopefully um, gather some enthusiasm from you guys if you want to join us. But before we do any of that, since you guys have been learning about the prison system and are, you know, knowledgeable in this area, we wanted to open it up to you guys and just ask, like, what it is that you guys are most interested in or what, um, there's like a specific subject or a specific thing that you guys are either like confused about or really pissed off about or you know interested in in regards to prison women in prison whatever it is just a couple of things so we get a sense of where you guys are at and say your name too never mind never mind yeah well, all right sorry all that enthusiasm with the clapping i thought for sure <laughs> No burning desires of something you've learned, <laughs> heard about prison. Wendy finds it hard to believe. It, yes. Okay. Okay, Daphne. Uh, my name is Bianca. Um, what's like the process that transgender people have to go through in the court system and like how do they decide what prison they go to? Like do they go based off of their biological sex or based off of what they identify as? That's a really, really good question. What's your name? Max. Max. Cool. Thanks, Max. Mm -hmm. How about one more topic question? Hi, I'm Will. Uh, really interested in solitary confinement. Like is it more harmful to prisoners, or does it actually help them? Your thoughts on it? Is it more harmful or what? Or helpful. helpful. Does it help them or hurt them? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Great. Thank you, guys. Yeah, sure. Um, are you guys answering questions just on your expectations about anything? Or are you guys interested in anything? Well, we'll get to like an official question and answer part. I just wanted to know like some of the topics you guys are interested in. Okay, I don't know if you guys answered it, but I'm really interested in um, psychological effects on juveniles who um, incarcerated, whether it's adult jail or Yeah. You know, juvenile. Yeah, cool. Um, and what's your name? Camila. Camila? Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. Thanks to you guys so much. Those are really, really good questions. and. Um, some of the work that CCWP does intersects with those questions, and so hopefully we'll speak to some of that throughout the presentations, but definitely during the question and answer times or afterwards or e through email or whatever. 
Um, it's just nice to know what you guys are thinking about. Um, so I'm going to give a, just a brief overview of the history of CCWP um, and say a little bit more about what we're up to right now. So CCWP was started in in the prisons in Chowchilla, which is two, out, two and a half hours southeast of the bay, um, sued the governor of California, who was Pete Wilson at the time, claiming that the health care that they were receiving in the prisons was so terrible that it constituted cruel and unusual punishment and therefore violated the Constitution. Um, and so they did this, the, the women inside did this, it was sort of spearheaded by this woman named Cherise Shoemate. And they did this by reaching out to um, other people who were outside of the prisons to help them. Because as I'm sure you guys are learning, people in prison have very little access. They have no access to the media. Their voices are really silenced. You know, prisons are intentionally far away from neighborhoods and communities where people live and are arrested. And that's an intentional move on the government to silence people and to keep this issue out of our perspective, right? Um, so it was a strategic move for the women who were suffering inside of these prisons to reach out to people outside of the prison and form a coalition on either side of the prison walls to try to take the government to task on this health care issue. Um, so there were many, many different strategies, including protesting in front of the prisons, um, and also some testimonials that happened inside the prison, people inside who were receiving such terrible health care um, were able to speak to officials from the governor's office of, and tell the stories of what was happening to them. And this included women who were pregnant and not receiving care, people who had HIV or AIDS, um, you know, people who were, were dying unnecessarily because they weren't receiving the health care that um, they needed. So they ended up winning this lawsuit. It was Sheree Shoemate versus Pete Wilson. Um, and that was a, hu a really significant, huge victory for our movement and for our organization and really was the foundation upon which CCWP was built. Unfortunately, as you guys will learn um, in the next hour, or it sounds like you already know, the healthcare, the lawsuit, winning the lawsuit didn't really do much as far as improving the conditions inside of the women's prisons. And it's still a huge, huge issue and it's one of the reasons why we're going to protest again in Chowchilla in two weeks. Um, but what happened, the sort of silver lining of this situation, is that CCWP, our organization, was born from this lawsuit. And we still work with that model. Our members are both inside prison and also outside of prison. Um, and as challenging as that is to do, we really, that's like a central focus of our organization to make sure that we are building membership on both sides and that we are keeping central the voices and experiences of people inside and people most impacted. Um, what else can I say about it? So some of the primary things that we do, we do legal visiting to the prisons. Um, we have many different visiting teams, so that's people on the outside who go and make legal visits to our members on the inside, and we advocate for them. So that's everything that looks like many different things, following up on um, appeals and issues they may be having inside of the prison, helping them with things like receiving health care or eyeglasses, contacting family members outside, um, and also just building relationships with people, because that's another way that the prison system works, and it's a way that the prison system works beyond just the architecture and the buildings of prisons, but in our, in our sort of, the way we internalize it is really by dividing us, right? Along race, along class lines, along, along sexual orientation, it's really saying like, we're dividing you guys to keep you away from each other, to keep you weak, and to keep you from being so strong that you could really take the system on. So that's part of how I think about the visiting that we do. We also visit in the San Francisco County Jail. Um, and to me, it's like really speaking back to that system to say, okay, all of society is built up to divide us. 
And by me sitting in a room with someone who has been deemed a criminal and I'm supposed to be afraid of is speaking back to that and is really about challenging racism, challenging capitalism, challenging all of these various things that the prison system is relies upon to exist. That's all a little bit of a side note. But it's all to say that we do these prison visits about, um, I think the teams go in like two, once every two months or so. And that's another way that we organize with people on the inside. Um, and this upcoming rally that we're planning started by our members inside saying like it's time to do something, you know, these issues are getting really out of hand. So we go to do prison visits to make sure that our leadership, our leaders inside are having their voices heard and we're able to bring those voices then outside. We also publish a newsletter which we brought some copies of. It's called The Fire Inside. It's been around since 1996, so you all were one years old then. Um, and it's published by written, all the articles are written by people inside. We give priority to women and transgender people in the California state prisons. Um, and it, we publish it out here, obviously, in the Bay, and then we send it to people in prison all throughout the country. Um, so it's a, another form of communication for people in prison. You know, it's very difficult to communicate with one another, and it's a way that we are raising consciousness about all the issues that are going on. Um, we do like tons of other stuff, stuff like this, you know, um, and lots of reentry support when our members do get out. The people that we support primarily are women and transgender people, and um, a lot of the people who we support are have are serving long-term sentences or life sentences, and many of them are serving um, time for either killing or injuring their partner. Um, during a time when self-defense was not allowed in the courtroom. So if you guys can think about it, before 1996, I want to say, yeah, um, evidence of self-defense was not allowed in a courtroom. So if there's a person who is being physically, emotionally, or psychologically abused by his or her partner, and we, primarily it's women who are being abused in the home, um, and then in an act of self-defense, that woman kills or injures her abuser. All of that evidence, if it's like years and years of physical abuse, none of that was allowed in the courtroom before 1996. So there are like two systems of violence that hap are happening for a lot of our members. The first being the abusive situation that they're in in the first place, and the second being that the system that's supposed to protect them is denying them the ability to, to talk about self-defense and to allow all those years of abuse to be present in the courtroom. So then a lot of our members went down for life sentences or for very long sentences when really that what happened was not adequately represented in the courtroom. Luckily now that's not the case and what we're seeing happen is some of our members are able to have their cases reopened and that evidence of self-defense is then reintroduced into their case. And some of our members, not nearly enough, are being released as a result of this. Um, so that's the population that we primarily work with, but not exclusively. Um, although we do really focus on transgender and um, women inside of state prison in California. We also work in the San Francisco County Jail, and we do a weekly self-empowerment group on Tuesday nights there. Um, and we also do visiting within the San Francisco County Jail and supporting people that way as well. Political education, tons of legal advocacy, um, really whatever we can do to help people out. So that's the background. Um, I'm going to pass it on, but we'll come back to the, the current issues around um, the protests that I've been mentioning in Chowchilla. So, and maybe we'll save all the questions for the end. Does that sound good? Yeah. All right. Thank you, guys. Whoever. Okay. Well, I'm here. Um, I joined C. My name is Fatma, and I joined CCWP uh, approximately a year ago. I did join it because um, I'm the mom of a now 21 year old, and uh, she got incarcerated at the age of 16 to juvenile hall. It took about a, a year and a half for her to get her trial, and uh, she was put into adult court, which meant 
on her 18th birthday. Instead of celebrating her 18th birthday, she was put from juvenile hall into San Francisco County Jail. And she has been in there now for over four years, waiting for her trial. There has not been a trial yet. Uh, so she's just wasting time and, and sitting there. Um, um, in the meantime, I'm trying to educate her. Uh, and to be sure, she actually earned her high school diploma in jail. She didn't have it when she got in. And it's, it's really hard to do. They're not very big on education in jail. And uh, just to, to get all the material and the courses you need for just a county diploma, I'm not even talking about a high school diploma in jail, just a county diploma. It can be really hard. A lot of classes get cut, and you can take them anymore, so you're not able to get your diploma, which also makes it difficult later on, uh, actually, to, to be released as well, because you do kind of need some, uh, you know, some, some education that makes you actually hireable. Um, so she did, she was able to, she was really lucky, actually. She was really one of the lucky ones, still to be able to uh, do all the courses and get a high school diploma. A lot of other ones were not as lucky. Uh, right now she's working on her um, college degree, which is in, in county jail is equally, it's even more difficult. I have enrolled her a year and a half in correspondence courses just for a regular business degree, uh, associate's degree, and she hasn't received any papers yet. Pe uh, papers that has been sent have been the first package they have sent back. Uh, other papers have been lost, so it just hasn't reached her. It's really hard. Like I said, a year and a half now she hasn't received anything to start her classes on on college. That's how hard it is to, to continue to education once you get into that bad situation and you are locked up in a county facility. So, um, and she's still waiting for a trial, and she's 21 years old now which also meant during this whole time, no prom. A anything you guys might be expecting, um, you know, uh, she did not have. She, every day in jail is the same. It's the same thing, same day in, day out. There's really nothing special around. You have your, your same routine every day, same food every day. Uh, you wouldn't even know there's anything going on outside, and, you know, unless I visit her and actually let her know what's going on. But even then, there's supervision. You always have to be uh, really careful what you say because everything is supervised by deputies. They hear your every word you say, so there's no privacy. And you have to be a little bit careful what you say so they don't might misunderstand it and maybe retaliate in some way on the inmate if they don't uh, like what you have said. Uh, a lot of books I sent her, especially educational books sometimes, they don't like it, they will send them back. Uh, they are sure they have rules, but, but like I said, you know, individual deputies, they might not like certain books. And they rather not have the inmate read it, they don't, they don't want to get them too smart and they send them back. There's nothing I can do about it. I can resend it, it won't get sent back. So um, everything, it's a highly controlled environment. And, and talking about lockup, I would say over half of her time she has spent in lockup uh, in county jail. Uh, it's solitary confinement, to be sure, in, in county jail. They call it administrative segregation. But, but it's the same, uh, it, it's basically solitary confinement in count, county jail. In prison, it's solitary confinement. Uh, Almost all of your privilege get taken away. She just has been out of lockup last week, actually. She has spent uh, a couple of months in lockup, actually for, for just tiny little things, not nothing big. Any reason they think uh, uh, gives them the authority to put you anywhere in jail. They can, they can basically do whatever they want to do, move her around from one cell to another. She, she really has no choice whatsoever and uh, visiting visiting is hard it's a half hour she can see somebody half hour each week there are long lines i have to come really really early in the morning 
wait in line at least like half an hour. I have to sign up for my half an hour visit, then go back and I can come back a couple of hours later and then see, and half an hour is not long. So how they, the inmates in county jail, how they actually, at least the women, I'm, I'm not sure about the men, but the women. It's uh, tables like this, they're all in a row. You have two tables. One row of tables, the inmates will sit, and there's a space in between, another row of table that's where the visitors sit. So there's no touching, no hugging, no kissing, you know, no, nothing like that. So you can't touch them, you can't um, give them anything. So you just can come in, keep their hands on the table and talk to them. But, but the whole room will be full of people. It's about six inmates each in one small room. Maybe the room is about the uh, six, uh, this room is like six times bigger than the visiting room they have. So, so you have to imagine there's six inmates on one side and at least six visitors on the other, all talking at the same time. And they haven't seen their people sometimes for a long time. It gets really, really noisy, you can't really hear anything. And if it gets too loud, the deputy will interfere, and then he will say, oh, be quiet, Every, everybody be quiet. And then nobody wants to talk anymore because we don't want him mad. And then by the time you know it, the visit is over and you haven't really understood half of the things actually uh, you came there to say. So visiting actually is not a pleasant experience either. It's everything you do in there is really hard. Uh, so if anybody has any questions about juveniles in, in juvenile court or uh, adult court, you know, I might can answer them. Maybe you can step into the question Camila, Camila had, right? Of the like, what would you a psychological, psychological impact? Uh, I could tell you directly about my daughter and her psychological impact. Well, number one, there's a, from one minute to the other, when a juvenile get arrested, they're not going home or wherever they came from. They're going straight into their cell. Um, so there's a big separation with, uh, I would say, the family, uh, maybe friends. They're, they're alone in there. They're growing up inside juvenile hall. She had spent a year and a half pretty much alone. The people who are there, who are with her there, weren't her friends anyway. She didn't really know them. So I think the separation between family, especially a family who doesn't really understand or doesn't take the time to understand about certain happenings that led to that situation. And so they might, they didn't come anymore. They might don't want to visit uh, or write. So uh, there's an alien, definite alienation from the family, and uh, and also the, the normal um, things you guys go all through on a daily matters. You know you don't have you don't have that. There's a stimulation from uh, friends, from peers. Uh, they take all the stimulations away. So you're basically you're in a little cell. They uh, they don't have enough people to talk to. They don't have enough um, material to read. And they don't really, my daughter didn't really develop in terms of, uh, she developed in terms of lawyer language. She knows every single blah, blah, blah about lawyers, really highly developed. But I think a lot of things, uh, the socialization is, was not there. So she's pretty much acquainted now to talk more to adults and older people than to her own peers. So that might could be a problem uh, making friends in her future life uh, who are the same age. And uh, there's no, uh, a lot of kids actually, they need uh, mental health, they need maybe a therapist, psychiatrist, because they have other issues that actually let, let them into that situation. And often that's not provided. Uh, my daughter needed a therapist, but there, she didn't get one. There was no mental health. She did get evaluated for mental health issues, and then found some depression and, and uh, all kinds of things, but uh, that was mainly for the court, for uh, the juvenile trial to determine if she's fit for the juvenile court or if she should be put into adult court. So it wasn't really for her uh, own best interest, that psychological evaluation. So anything that might found, um, 
completely got put underneath the table and forgotten. Uh, so there's no mental health care. Uh, even normal health care is really hard to, to to get by in there. I remember last week she was uh, sick with the flu. Um, and she didn't. Ask, she just asked for Tylenol. I think that was the only thing they could give her. It came like a what? It took five days for them to to give their her some Tylenol. You know, having the flu for already like for a week. Took them five days. By that time, she didn't need it anymore. So those things are missing. Basically, juvenile uh, was the same way. Uh, whatever she asked for was uh, came very delayed. Um, and it's just a minimal contact to the outside world where juveniles need to grow up. All the stimulation, going out there, having different experiences, like having a prom or a graduation, having a graduation party. Those are all normal parts of growing up. And if, if you don't have that, if you're completely isolated, basically by the time you come out of jail or prison, there's um, part of that child that still needs growing or all those missing parts uh, that still need growing and that it, she can't do that. So when she comes out, she kind of has to, uh, you know, pick up where she left off. And you never know where that is because of the lack of experiences. So you might uh, come out of, those juveniles, if they come out of jail or prison, uh, it's uh, really hard to adjust to a daily life and often, um, you know, I've heard over and over again, like, phobia is a big problem because everything in there is so controlled. You get your food at the same time. Uh, uh, you get told when you can take a shower, those kind of things. And, uh, you, you know, real life requires much more independence than that. So the independence, I, I would say, is one of, one of the bigger things juveniles lack who grow up in an institution. So it's a lot of things that don't learn. Um, you learn she has not been convicted yet. The trial has no the, the no trial yet. She's still waiting for a trial. What's her charge? Yeah. Huh? Uh, charges were. If I, okay, <laughs> I have to really think hard. Just because of the fact when whenever you make a mistake, there's like like ten charges behind it. I think the the major charge probably would be uh, assault with a deadly weapon. So that's a, that's a major charge. Yeah. And it takes that long to get a trial because the system is so overloaded. So um, yeah, she's still innocent in jail, she's, but she gets treated like she's been convicted, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Nobody in there gets treated special, convicted or not, it doesn't matter, you all get treated the same way. Um, are other needs, other needs that she have being met in like prison, like you know, like when women have their monthly things, they give her like pads and stuff? Yeah, the sheep is once. <laughs> you don't get a choice, you kind of get the cheapest ones. And actually it was a problem at first. Um, you know, those little things can be a problem. She had, a little, uh, she had an allergy against those pads at first. And, uh, you know, just something you have to live with inside there because there's nothing else. So something she just has to live with. Um, so it's very uncomfortable <laughs> for her. Uh, yeah, you do get pads. But I do have to say, she has uh, very long hair. And it does require uh, a normal shampoo and conditioning. They don't have no conditioning in their eyes. I have to buy her those really expensive health packages I can order for her that come with one bottle of Shepo conditioner. So she has something to, to put into her hair uh, so it doesn't fall all off and dry so off. It's really because you only really get a soap in there, I believe, so it's just some soap. Uh, maybe a toothbrush, some sheep or toothpaste, and that's that. How much does a this cost? The average, uh, specifically the health package, by the time I'm done with taps and shipping and handling, it's almost $50. And there's not much in it. I think if you would go to Walgreens and buy even better quality products, 
uh, and you would create a package like, like this of your own, you can easily do that with half the money. <laughs> and uh, another aspect, actually, um, what affects her in there is um, her eyes got really, really bad because there's no sunlight. County jails are not really designed to keep somebody for so many years. So she wears glasses now, and um, uh, she's farsighted. And I can tell you, nobody in my family ever has been or is farsighted. Neither my in-laws have any problems with being farsighted. So I, I exclusively um, think that uh, blame the jail for it. And, yeah, really. And um, because of con the constant uh, fluorescent light in there she has, and they never get turned off even at night. At night. So imagine this light up there and you sleep about a few inches underneath that light on a bunk every night. That's basically your room. That's where you have to sleep every night and you never, that light never ever turns off. And you have never any kind of sunlight. So of course it has an effect on uh, your eyes. Maybe not some people, but in her it did. So she's wearing some pretty uh, heavy glasses now. Her sight is really, really bad. more questions later. Hi, my name is Wendy and I am an active member of CCWP. I've been an active member for the last 10 years. I was a I was currently. I'm not currently. I, <laughs> I have been in prison for 17 and a half years for second degree murder. My boyfriend decided that he was in a jealous rage and killed someone and he got arrested in December. I was arrested six months later after I quit seeing him, quit visiting, kept quit supporting him. So six months later I got accessory after the fact of murder. So I've been in the prison system for the last 17 years, probably as long as you guys have been born. And I've recently uh, been found suitable by the governor. And for the last hundred days, I've been out. I am one of the fortunate ones that are serving a life sentence and was able to get out. So um, I could tell you the ins and outs of prison, but I couldn't tell you the ins and outs of high school or as society as a whole. But. I'm learning. Uh, I got a cell phone. Uh, I don't know how to work a computer. Uh, I don't dress myself. Other people dress me. His, uh, in prison, that's all you wear is the same clothes every day. Blue pants and a blue shirt. You wear the same boots that you wear because that's the, the uniform that you get in prison. Uh, it's just the same. My hair is the same as prison. I'm going to get a new one sometime soon, hopefully. But you know, it's, it's a steady start because just like Dagmar was saying, it's a constant same thing over and over every single day. I might not look like the average inmate that you believe that you see on TV. I don't have any tattoos. I don't have any extra piercings. That's because when I went to prison, I was 21. I just decided that from that point forward is that I was going to work on myself, not working on, I was very codependent. I thought I had to hang out with the cool kids and look at what the cool kids got me a 15 to life sentence. So when I went to prison, I was angry and uh, had an attitude, uh, you know, nobody could tell me anything or, oh, please leave me alone. And, you know, I see it a lot in the classroom as well. I used to be there, been there, done that, you know, the teacher irritates me, all those things. But you know what? They're here for a reason. They don't get paid really enough to put up with a lot of crap that they do, but this is their passion. Because, you know, once upon a time they had a teacher that inspired them. And that's what happened to me when I went to prison. There was a teacher that said that they seen the light in me and I didn't believe it into myself. Then when CCWP came, I did, they kept like, believing in me. They were like, oh, well, I read your case. I can't believe you're here. I'm like, well, I am here. You know, screw it. No, I don't care. I, you know, once you get a life sentence with any governor, you just never know what type of, what you, when you're going to get out of prison, especially with the sentence that I had. And um, four years ago, I was found suitable by um, the, gov uh, the commissioners that come and see you. You have 
Once you're a lifer, you have to go in front of two commissioners and the district attorney that prosecuted you. So when they found me suitable for parole, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger took it away from me. So in April, I got found suitable again, and Jerry Brown allowed me to be released from prison. So does anybody have any questions, comments, or concerns? Yes, we <laughs> <laughs> okay, So what? On it's not a snitch thing. It's called accessory after the fact. So I lied and said I didn't know anything because, you know, when you're with someone, you want to be loyal to that person. You want to be that ride or die person or you want to be that cool kid and say, that's my man. And look what happened. And also it's an example of how fucked up the system is, right? That somebody who was like so far removed from the situation and the actual harm that happened got like roped into it. You know what I mean? Absolutely. I was not there when the murder happened. I wasn't physically there, emotionally wasn't there. I was none of the above, so just it just shows you how justice do you. First degree murder. <clears throat> He's there for first degree murder. He's doing 25 to life. And so he killed somebody and you weren't there, but you still got convicted. Absolutely. Why did he kill somebody? Out of jealousy. Oh. Have you ever, oh. ever watched a movie with battered women and all those things? That was one of me. I allowed the person to come into my life and control my life. And, you know, you wanted to be that that person to show them love or whatever the case may be. Because I used to be the one going, I would never be in a relationship like that. You know, screw that. But I ended up in one. And I, you know, I had no self-esteem, no self-worth, no nothing. And I blamed it on my parents because my parents are addicts. My parents are in and out of prison. So I said I was a product of my own environment. I blamed everyone for my own choices. But in reality, it was my choice. Um, now that you're out, like, what are, like, what are your goals or, like, things that you want to achieve? Yeah. This is it, speaking out, advocating for women in prison. If you, if you ever watch a, a prison movie and you see that a man or two people to a room, and for women it's eight people to a room. What? No. And you have no choice of who lives with you, you have no choice of what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> what is going on? So that's my advocacy. There's a whole clear uh, discrimination between women and men prisons. Men have a lot more, uh, I don't know, they have a lot more than women do. Women, they just, they already have a whole set judgment against women being in prison and being in a room for me versus it. There, I live with eight people for 17 years, eight people. I've lived with people that are uh, not stable mentally. Physically, they have need help, colostomy bags, diapers, people that have tried to commit suicide, cutting their throat, and oh having 21 stitches in their throat. Mm -hmm. You know, all those things are factors that if you were in a man's prison, you would never, you would never have to be housed that way. Can you talk about how big the rooms are for the eight Oh, eight people is probably, from this pillar right here, and to probably right here. So eight people are in this room. There's there's four sets of two uh, four sets of bunk beds in there. Yes. What was the transition like when you were released from prison? When Dagmar talked about phobias, I have a phobia. I have a clear indication of anxiety. I have been labeled general as anxiety because I get anxiety as in when people start moving around real fast and. And um, like in a store, you have all those noises, people calling over the intercom, and everyone going to which way in a different direction. I get a little anxiety, like what the, but because in prison, you only go one way. Everyone goes the same way. In the past, you had to have your shirts tucked in and your hands in your pocket. You don't have to do that now, but you still go in that same way. So when a whole bunch of people are walking in one direction, or two, uh, a whole bunch of directions, I get a little like paranoid. And before you went to prison, you didn't have that problem? No. You only go one way. Everyone goes the same way. You, the, they have a track around where you live. You go one way around the track. You can't go 
two, it's not a two lane street, it's only a one way street. That's, that's the only way. You only get to shop once a month, so if your family sends you money, they take 22% of it, and then you only get to shop so much a month. If your pa if your family sends you $100, you get 88 of it, and that's what you have to shop for the whole month. Yes. So um, when you got out of prison, like, did you have family to support you? So like, you think you back on your feet? Like, did you have to go to a program to help you? I'm at a program now. I'm at 214 Walden House. What does that program do for you? Well, it's just a slow and steady for me. Like, um, like I said, I get phobias of things that go on, and then just like when I said I was a lifer in prison, all everybody in here went <gasps> that judgment right there. I'm used to it now. But like, if I were to go interview for a, a, a job, and they say, "Where have you been for the last 17 years?" and I say, "Prison." What? It, it helps me train myself to be better at saying, yes, I was in prison, and not be shameful about it. Because usually when people say, oh, well, you know, murder and all these things, well, there are already judgments against that.
Two of them are in Chowchilla, and one is down in LA, near LA. And one of the prisons in Chowchilla, it's called, it was called Valley State Prison for Women, is being converted into a men's facility. And right now, we just heard there are now less than 100 women who are there, and they've been transferring men in from throughout the state. And the reason why they're doing this is because about a year ago, the US Supreme Court um, mandated that California prisons be, um, that they're st said that California prisons are overcrowded. There's a crisis in California state prisons, and we need to do something about it. So um, in an effort to re reduce the overcrowding in the men's prisons, they've been transferring people and sort of shuffling them throughout the state. But what's happening as a result of this is that now the, the women's prisons are severely, severely overcrowded. So we've gotten rid of one facility for women. Thousands of women and transgender people have been transferred from that facility into the two remaining state prisons. So one of them is across the street. It's called Central California Women's Facility. Usually it, it has a capacity of 2,000 people, which is still so much, if you guys can imagine. And right now it's almost at 4,000 people. So it's 185% at capacity. So this is part of the eight, eight people in a room. They're preparing to turn the gym and the day room into um, cell, into bedrooms with, with bunk beds in there. It means a delay, and even more of a delay in medical care. So we're seeing some of our members who were on prescribed medication at Valley State Prison are having to go back in front of um, a 12 panel of doctors to prove that they have an illness to get the same medication that they've been on for years. And so this is life-threatening for a lot of people. Um, we're also seeing that elderly people who need to use a wheelchair or a walker or people with disabilities who usually have priority to be on the lower bunk because it's just easier, um, that priority has now been disregarded and they're being forced to climb to the top bunk of bunk beds. Um, and, and you know, people are tense, like their entire lives have been disrupted and uprooted, friends that they've made, partners they've made inside, you know, these chosen families that people have, programming, all of this has been uprooted and people are really, really suffering as a result of this conversion. Um, and so we are going down to Chowchilla on the 26th of January, which is less than two weeks away, to make no some noise and to tell uh, Jerry Brown, the governor, um, and to tell the prison system that we're paying attention to this, you know, and that we um, aren't going to let this happen anymore. And we're also going down to make sure that our members inside, who are the ones that really started this process happening and told us, like, it's time to protest again, we need to do something about this, to let them know that we're there and that we hear them, you know, and we're there in solidarity with them. So it's this huge statewide mobilization. People from throughout California are going to be coming to Chowchilla. Um, we're getting high school students from Oakland to come. The Youth Justice Coalition, which is this really rad youth organization in LA, is coming up on a bus. Um, and we're going to do a speak out in front of the prison. So people who've been inside are going to be sharing their experiences, family members of people inside. Um, we're going to have music and drums and, you know, whatever we can do to try to get the word out about this. And our basic messaging around this is that, um, our basic messaging in general is like, release people, release people, release people. You know, CCWP is a prison abolition organization at the heart. We don't believe that the prison system as it is today is functioning, is serving people, is rehabilitating anyone. It's not the answer. It's absolutely not the answer. And so our messaging for this particular rally is bring our loved ones home, release people. There are tons of ways in which people can be released. Sacramento has all of these various alternative custody programs, which means community programs or ankle monitor programs that would significantly reduce the population of people in prison, and they're just simply not implementing them. So if they did implement these programs, for up to 4,000 people who are eligible would be released from prison, which would significantly lower the population and reduce some of the tensions that are coming up around overcrowding. But the people in Sacramento are not doing that because the prison system is also a huge money-making business, as I'm sure you guys are learning too. I mean, it's the prison guard union is the strongest union in the country, right? So it's like really threatening, and I see this in the jail too, it's really threatening to deputies and to cops, and 
to correctional officers to do the work that we're doing because it will potentially put them out of a job, and that's what we want, you know? Uh, we want those people to have a miraculous change of heart and be on our side, you know? Yeah, I, for example, I can't go in there saying I'm from CCWP. Um, I come in there as a, a personal visitor to see my daughter, and I keep my mouth shut about my activities um, just so they won't cause any trouble, which they probably, um, they would cause me some trouble or maybe retaliate on my daughter for doing such work, so I have to stay quiet about it. I uh, can discuss it with her, who is actually also a member, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we have, and we have to keep her quiet for those reasons. Yeah. They must yeah. not know. Which is, to me, that's part of an indication that we're it, that we're doing a good job, you know? It's like, if people are feeling threatened, it's like, then we're doing a good job, then we're spreading the word and we're getting the message out there that this system is really messed up, you know, and really ruins people's lives. Um, a lot of people that they really just land up in, in jail, a lot of them, you know, we are all human beings and some people really do make mistakes, especially if it's like peer pressure, there's a lot of other people involved. It's easy sometimes in life to slip all of a sudden, oh my gosh, what have I done? But then to find out you're in the system and you're caught up in the system, and you find out you might never ever want to come back out, you know, it puts things in a different light and it's not, it's not uh, fair to a lot of people who are in there. Absolutely. I know people that are inside the prison are doing life without the possibility of parole. That means they don't have a chance whatsoever. And they were at 14 and 15 when they were arrested. So, it, you know, one split second, one bad decision, it's like that. Being overcrowded, we also have a problem with staph infections, scabies, you name it, because we're all smashed in there together. And people say, well, I'm not going to get it, but, you know, if you're crowded into one little room, you're going to, you know, I'm not saying you're going to all of a sudden get it because I've never had scabies, but I've seen people with uh, scars from scabies because their roommates have had scabies when they come in, head lice, people that have hepatitis C, and they just bring it in and be careless and not tell anybody. It's, you know, it's their choice not to disclose that information, but it is the, also, too, is that there is no public health awareness in the prison itself, people that have HIV. Of course, there's drugs run rapid in the prison system, but there's only one needle, so guess who shares it? All the needle users use it. Uh, everybody that come goes in with one tattoo, and they come out full-fledged tattoos from head to toe. I've seen someone go in as a pretty, pretty, pretty girl and leave out as a pretty, with a tattooed uh, boy with no hair, tattoos on his head, on his face, all over the place. You know, that's his own identity. I'm not one to judge. But where do you get the tattoo equipment? Who's to say? And uh, what did he come out with? Yeah, he came out with HIV and hepatitis C. But that was his choices. But if there were more awareness in the prison system about what goes on, ear piercing, nose piercing, lip piercing, it's all rapid, too, in the prison system because everybody wants to be a cool kid in prison and they get piercings or whatever. But the same needle that they tattooed with and they just shot up with is the same needle so everybody's sharing the same thing makeup as well there's pink eye you name it that people use the same mascara the same eyeliner and they end up with pink eye or some type of staph infection in the eye itself because public yeah don't share makeup sharing is not caring I promise <laughs> Just to like contextualize that a little bit is to say that like people don't need to be in these situations, Absolutely. you know, where they're given such few choices mm -hmm. and they feel as though like in order to feel empowered, they're going to tattoo themselves because they have nothing else to do, you know, that kind of thing. It's like this whole situation could be irrelevant. It could be erased if we came up with different ways to deal with harm that happens. Absolutely. With the 4,000 women that should be out on the ankle monitor or wherever, that would only leave like 2,000 people left in prison. And those will be the ones that are doing long-term and life sentences. And that they'll get their turn when it is soon, you know, deemed necessary. But those who are, are found, found ready to go to the ankle monitor or anything else, absolutely. They need to just let them go. And it uh, leaves the resources to the one to the 
ones who actually need to be locked up. I mean, there are people who need to be locked up. And it leaves those resources that are all wasted on the people who don't really need to be there. It can go to those people or to the education system, to the schools. Absolutely. Because that's basically where it's coming out from. You know, they're locking little kids up. They don't let them ever come back out. It has happened. Uh, and it does happen. Well, has now. Um, and, and the money goes there. The money gets wasted on locking them up instead of uh, putting it back into education where it belongs to, to prevent those things by uh, making people knowledgeable. Oh, did you have a question? Yeah, I thought you could, um, people in Korea weren't able to like wear piercings or makeup and stuff. So you can wear makeup, minimal makeup. It has to be natural skin tone, so if it's any other color, you can not wear blue, green, anything like that. It has to be brown. Lipstick as well. You can't wear any color lipstick. So like piercing, because I thought that's like, you it's can't illegal have in prison. It's illegal. A lot of things are illegal in prison, but you know. So maybe we can speak to the, the two questions that I don't think we got to, and then you guys want to see some videos and some of our members. So do you want to maybe speak to the? You had a question about Bianca, like women, women pregnant, and. Question about transgender. Women that are pregnant in prison, they there's not enough food and I don't know, not enough food or health care. You get to see the doctor maybe once a month if you have any like any type of complication. You have to fill out a piece of paper and then you put it in a box and you might get seen a week or two later. But you also have to pay five dollars for that. So if you don't have five dollars, it kind of gets pushed back. And up until October, October September, uh, I think it was October, there was a law that was passed in October, but prior to that, women had to be shackled to the bed while they're giving birth. You give birth, you give birth to the, your baby, and then the next day, you, if you don't have someone to come and pick up your child, they'll go automatically to CPS or be adopted out as well. And you don't get to spend any time So yeah, this legislation that that some um, people in similar organizations to ours worked on, they worked on for this piece of legislation for three years, and it finally passed. And the legislation states really explicitly that when a woman knows that she's pregnant, from the moment she knows she's pregnant until after she has given birth, she cannot be shackled at any point in time, not walking down the hall, not to the bed while giving birth. It was like a huge, huge victory, you know? I We had a celebration um, party at the women's building in San Francisco after this legislation passed. And I remember feeling so conflicted, like this is an amazing victory. And in this movement, we don't get to celebrate victories very often, which is why we clap when people say they got out of prison, you know, because it's a miracle. Um, and it, it felt so amazing, but also I was like, this is so barbaric that I am sitting here celebrating the fact that women who are pregnant are not shackled to a bed while they're giving birth. You know what I mean? Like, this is the world we live in. We're like, this is what we have to fight against, right? Like, as though a woman's gonna get up and leave in the middle of her birth and start running for freedom, you know? <laughs> it's just like, really, really obscene. Um, does that answer your question about? Yeah, okay. Um, and then the other question about transgender people in prison, um, more often than not, and you can speak to this too, people, if let's say you are um, male-bodied and you identify as female, and you're a transgender woman, more often than not you are placed in a male facility. So usually, I would say like 95% of the time, what happens is they go by your biology and place you in a facility. Um, there's an organization that we work with called the Transgender Gender Variant Justice Project. And they work with transgender people in prison and majority trans women in prison. Um, and you can imagine you know, the violence that exists within prisons, within male facilities, and for someone who is trans identified, who is female presenting to come into that environment is incredibly incredibly violent um, and those people are incredibly vulnerable. In Sa at San Francisco County Jail, there's a separate section, they call it a uh, tank, which is just stupid.
stupid and offensive. Um, but there's like a transgender pod basically for vulnerable populations. So there's some uh, separation and, and segregation that happens for safety reasons at San Francisco County Jail. Um, there are some people who are trans identified who will be placed in a facility based on their gender identity rather than their biology. Um, but that's rare and oftentimes that's a result of having um, surgery, bottom surgery on your genitals. So it's, it's not, I don't think there's any real protocol about it, um, but it's certainly a really serious subject and also some of the most vulnerable populations of people in prison are queer people, people whose genders don't conform to the bodies that they have. Um, and yeah, do you have any? Just that if you are a biologically a male and you're in a female institution, you've had your surgery or you have been brutally hurt or battered in a male's facility, and that's why you're in a woman's facility after that. Usually it doesn't happen, maybe, I don't know, more, but if you are biologically a male, if you're going to be in a male's facility, women as well that identify as male, you know, they get teased, battered, they get the same, does that answer your question? Yeah. Did you have something? Yeah. So, it's kind of for the organization. Like, why do you guys work with transgenders? Like, what do you like, do through the organization and stuff? Why do we or what do we do specifically? Well, it kind of both. <laughs> um, I've just heard like a lot of, like the last people we heard from, they were like dealing with women. Like I haven't really heard of the transgender women before. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think there are a lot of ways to answer this question, and I would say that CCWP is at its heart a feminist organization. And um, feminism, to me, like, what do you guys think of when you hear the word feminist? <laughs> Nothing? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Ever heard it? No. Honestly? Um, <laughs> I don't know what it is. What's that? Um, it's kind of... Um, no, it's okay. and say like we are all in this together and no matter what way you identify 
And it's also about recognizing that um, transgender people are often the most, and people of color and working class people and poor people are the most vulnerable populations in our society. Um, that's how power plays out, you know, that people who are identified as transgender, people of color, et cetera, et cetera, you know, that these are the people who are often struggling the most because our government and our society is not providing people with basic, basic needs. You know what I mean? You guys know this, right? <laughs> I'll tell you. Um, so that's part of the reason why we do that work and why we are not exclusively for women. I will say that we have very few male-bodied, male-identified people who work with us. Um, and we have had in the past men who work with us or who volunteer or who intern, and that's really awesome. Um, but for the most part, we are women, queer people, and transgender people. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, cool. So y'all want to see some videos? Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.